Hello, welcome to lecture 14 for Privacy and Machine Learning and Statistics. And today we're going to talk about projection mechanisms. So this is going to be another idea for improving the accuracy of linear query release. It's technically quite different from factorization mechanisms, but it's an idea that can be uh, combined with factorization, although we're not going to talk about combining it with factorization today. And uh, it's going to build on the framework we set up last time when we talked about factorization mechanisms. So if you need to review that uh, material, I recommend doing that now, just so all the notation and the setup are in place. Um, and without further ado, let's talk about projection mechanisms. So at a high level, the idea of the projection mechanism is that we want to make sure that the answers are consistent with being the correct answers on some data set. So to see what I mean, suppose uh, we take a simple example where the data domain is just the numbers 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so everyone's data is a number 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to ask two queries. And the first query is going to say, you know, how many people take the value 1? And the second query is going to be how many people have the value 1 or 2. Or I should say what fraction of people have these values. So you might remember these are the two non-trivial threshold queries. Everyone has a number. And the first query says how many people's number is at most 1. And the second query says how many people's number is at most 2. These are the only two that have an interesting answer. So the true answers are going to be uh, some a1, a2, uh, which is equal to f of the histogram. And then if we were to um, add Gaussian noise and use the Gaussian mechanism, we would get some other answer, a1 hat, a2 hat. That's f of h plus noise. So let's think about what it means when I say that we want to enforce consistency. Well, A1 and A2, regardless of what the true histogram is, satisfy some constraints. So first of all, we know that uh, A1 can't be smaller than 0, because it's asking what fraction of users have the data 0.1, so it's at least a 0 fraction. And also, you know, A2 has to be at least A1, because the difference between A2 and A1 is what fraction of people satisfy, have the data point 2, and that's a non-zero uh, non number, or non-negative number. And both of these answers have to be at most 1, because um, it can't be that more than 100% of people in the data set satisfy 1. So not, not every vector of answers A1, A2 is a feasible, uh, a feasible solution. Right? So if you look at the plane, if this is like the A1 axis and this is the A2 axis, then the set of feasible answers is like all numbers where A1 is bigger than 0 and A2 is bigger than 0 and both numbers are at most 1. So this is one, this is one, and a2 is bigger than a1. So the set of feasible answers is actually only like this region of the plane. All right, so these are like the set of like feasible answers that we could actually get if we evaluate the queries on some real data set. So maybe our real answers are here. But when we add Gaussian noise, we might get that a hat is actually out here. Whoops. Right? A hat might actually not be a feasible set of answers. It might take the answers um, in such a way that one of the two numbers becomes bigger than 1, or less than 0, or maybe a2 becomes smaller than 1. Okay, so the thing is that a hat doesn't have to be consistent. because I'm just adding Gaussian noise in an arbitrary direction 
So there's no nothing that guarantees that the noise I add will cause a to a hat to stay in the gray shaded area. Okay, but maybe that's okay. Maybe all we care about is that a hat is close to a, but we might just want them to be consistent for reasons having nothing to do with accuracy per se. We might want that the answers can be interpreted as the true answers on some other data set. And there's a lot of reasons we might want that um, having to do with statistical properties. Maybe one reason to want that, which is a little bit um, maybe easier to think about, is that we might want to feed these answers into some downstream process that might be expecting answers that are consistent with some real data. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to get answers that are consistent with some real data. And the way to do that is what's called projection. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll find a tilde that is closest to a hat, but is still in the gray shaded area. All right. And specifically, what that means is a tilde is going to be the projection of a hat onto the gray set, which is defined as the thing that minimizes over all a prime in the gray shaded area, a prime minus a hat in the two norm. So you can see the way I drew it. The closest thing to a hat that is in the gray shaded area is the point, uh, the blue point a tilde. And just to complete this, I'm going to give this gray set a name C, uh, script C. And this is formally the projection onto the set script C. And I'm minimizing over everything in the gray set. All right. So what I can do is I can enforce that the answers I get are consistent by taking a hat and projecting into the feasible set. All right, and there's a couple nice properties of this projection. So first of all, it gives me consistent answers, which is what I want. Okay, so property one, a tilde is consistent with some data set or the histogram for some data set h tilde, right? So a tilde equals f of h tilde for some h tilde. Okay, so that's what's that's good. That means I can interpret a tilde as being some actual set of answers. And the other thing that's nice is that the distance between a tilde and the true answers a is at most the distance between a hat and the true answer is A. So projection does not increase distance. OK, so that's good. Projection doesn't increase distance. So at least if we're interested in this L2 notion of accuracy, uh, projection never hurts. It can only help. So that's kind of cool. And three is that a tilde is also epsilon delta dp if a hat is, so post-processing, right? So we can do whatever kind of projection we want without worrying about privacy. So projection is like this thing we get to add on to the end of our algorithm. It doesn't hurt privacy. It gives us consistent answers. And at least if what we really care about is the L2 distance between the private answers and the true answers, it doesn't hurt in any way. Now, that second statement is like a little bit hard to unpack, but for purposes of you know, what, we, what we've been studying so far, the thing we care about is having the closest answers in some metric, such as the L2 metric. And so for our purposes, we'll say that projection kind of never hurts. So projection doesn't hurt. Again, like that statement might be like a little bit more controversial than it sounds, 
because we can cause other notions of error to increase other than the one uh, than the L2 norm. But for our purposes, projection doesn't hurt, and that's a nice thing. So it's like this free thing we get to do that gives us some extra properties. And what we're going to show today is that projection might help. That's not how you spell help. Projection might help a lot. Okay, so I'll put might in quotes, but there are interesting settings where actually doing this projection not only doesn't increase the error, but can dramatically decrease the error. Okay, so even if you look at my picture, you'll notice that A tilde is a little bit closer to A than A hat was, but not dramatically so. But what we'll see is that actually the projected point can be dramatically closer to A than the noisy point A hat. And not only that, but it can even be much closer sort of in a setting where it can actually make, uh, it can be close to A even when A tilde seems like it's so far from A as to be useless. So once we get into an actual theorem, I'll do a little more interpretation for you. So let me sort of explain a little bit more about what I mean by projection can help. So let's suppose we just have one counting query. So. Okay, so projection can help. Okay, so suppose we just have like one counting query f. So suppose f is a single count. Okay, so all right, so what that means is that the answer a lives in 0, 1. So the set of consistent answers is just the interval 0, 1. So if I draw like the real line and I draw the gray area from 0 to 1, this is the set of consistent answers. And my true answer is like some number here. And my noisy answer might be something here that's not consistent. All right, and then my projected answer in that case would just be zero. All right, so what I get is that it's not, not too hard to see that the d absolute distance between A and A hat is strictly less than the absolute distance between A and A tilde. Okay, there's just there's not really anything like to this. It's just that the projection can actually bring us closer to A than we started. So we're adding lots of noise, but we're actually projecting and we're removing some of the noise. We're making the answer less noisy. All right, but something you might you know think about this is like this isn't so great, right? I mean, all we've really done is we've made a tilde like as noisy as it can possibly be without being like a silly answer that's negative right so you might say like you know this isn't great because any time a tilde is outside of the gray area it gets replaced with an answer that's still really bad okay but what we're actually going to show is that sometimes a hat the noisy answer is really, really bad. It looks like it should be so far from the true answer that it basically tells you nothing. And yet the projected answer is going to be very accurate. It's going to be um, very close to A. So again, we'll see an example, but what I want to sort of point out is that the statement projection can help on its own is a kind of trivial statement. It's not, there's nothing really surprising about it. But what we're going to see is that it can help in a way that's actually very surprising. So. Let me introduce the model a little more formally again, just so we have it in front of us. And let me also introduce a picture that's going to be useful. So if I give you a set of queries f, then it's specified by some matrix. And that matrix has m columns. And I'm going to call the columns little c1 through little cm. OK, so remember, the rows correspond to queries, but the matrix, of course, also has columns. And the set of consistent points is going to be called C. And it's all of the possible answers. So let me clarify. So there's K queries, 
domain of size m, so it's k by m matrix. So c is going to be all of the answers a of the form f times h, where h is some histogram. I should also clarify. So what does that mean? So that means that it's all the answers a such that a is equal to f of f times h, where h is a histogram, meaning it's like a non-negative vector, and it's entries sum to 1. All right, so that's the set of consistent points. All right, so that basically means that it's all of the answers that can arise as the answer of the true, the, the true answer to the queries on some data set of an arbitrary size. All right, so this is all A can be the true answer on some data set of arbitrary size. All right. So this is just like the gray area that I drew um, in, in my examples, but I'll just give it, now it's just some general set. All right, and an important thing about C is that C can be written as the convex hull of the columns of the matrix. Whoops. So right, if this is the point C1, and this is the point C2, and this is the point C3, then the set C is what's called the convex hull of all of those points. It's the smallest convex set that contains all of those points. All right, and that's because when we multiply f by h, we're taking a combination of all of the columns where the coefficients are specified by h. And um, that means that's called the, that, that thing is called the convex hull of, of C. So C is like this, this shape, okay? It's some shape, it's some convex shape, and it's a subset of k-dimensional space. All right, so when we project, what we're doing is we're taking some true vector a and c. We're like getting some noisy vector a hat, and then we're finding like the closest a tilde that's in c. Right, so this is what's sometimes called uh, or sorry, jumping ahead. Okay, but C C is an important object. So the queries give us this shape C, and the geometry of this shape is what's going to be important. So now let me just formally describe the projection mechanism so that we can um, uh, go on. So we're given some set of linear queries, and there's not there's no requirement on the queries. It can be anything, but it's a little it's going to be useful when I like interpret the algorithm to assume that the queries represent counts, so all the entries are in zero to one, and that's just going to let me talk more concretely about what is the error and make some comparisons. So the projection mechanism has two steps, and the first step is just the Gaussian mechanism. So I compute the true answers A, which are F times H, where H is the histogram representing my data. And then I compute what I'll call the noisy answers, which are A hat, which is A plus Z, where Z is some Gaussian random vector. And the Gaussian random vector is going to have a magnitude. It'll have a standard deviation that's um, determined by the sensitivity of the queries F. So one of the reasons I want to assume their counts is that if, if they're counts, then I know that the sensitivity is at most um, root k over n. Okay, so that'll tell me what sigma squared should be. But it's not so important when I analyze what sigma squared is. It's just, you know, when we want to make a final statement about the accuracy, we need to know what sigma squared is. But for now, I'm just going to think of sigma squared as a parameter, and we'll analyze it in terms of sigma squared, and only at the end will we plug in a particular value for sigma squared. All right, so the last step is I'll do the projection. I'll return a tilde, which is going to be the minimizer over all points in C of the distance between that point and a hat in the L2 norm. Okay, and 
it's going to go a lot better if we remember, um, you know, for the future, like what are the true answers, what are the noisy answers, and what are the projected answers. So A are the true answers on my data, A hat are the true answers plus Gaussian noise, and A tilde are the answers, the noisy answers projected back into the set of consistent answers. Okay, so that's the projection mechanism. And what we'd like to do is analyze the error of this mechanism. All right, so we want to know how far apart are A tilde and A. And this analysis is pretty cool, a little bit magical, kind of subtle, right? It's really not you know, clear why this projection step should help so much. And it's not exactly clear how to think about the error of the projection step. So the key picture is what I just drew. So the black kind of you know, hexagon shape is C. And this A here are the true answers. So it's just some point on the inside of C. Not necessarily on the inside, but kind of in general, it's on the inside. This is the noisy answers, which are A plus Z. And of course, the projection mechanism should really only be useful if A plus Z is like way outside of the set. If, if it's inside the set, then it doesn't help to do any projection. I just return A hat itself. So let's think about the case where A hat is like outside of C. Now, A tilde is the projected point. And once I have all three of my red points, a hat, A, A hat, and A tilde, I can start to sort of analyze the distance between A tilde and A. And to do that, I need to know something, of course, about like, what is A hat and how does it relate to A? So the key thing I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna draw the line in purple between A tilde and A. All right, so it's not clear why I care about this thing, but let me draw the line. Of course, you know, what I care about is the length of the line segment from A tilde to A. So maybe that's why it should be intuitive that this line is sort of useful. And um, I'll draw the, the purple line out to infinity. So I, I won't draw the segment. I'll draw like the whole line. And now I'm going to add a fourth point. And that fourth point is going to be the orthogonal projection of A hat onto the purple line. So what I mean by you know the orthogonal projection, right, is I'm gonna take the p is going to be like the the shadow that the line a to a hat casts on the purple line. All right, so um, okay, so that's the that's a, a fourth point I'm gonna want to consider, and one really important observation is that the orthogonal projection of A hat onto P is going to lie outside of the set of consistent answers C. So why is that true? Well, suppose it was inside. Then if it were inside, it lies on the purple line, and it would lie strictly in between A tilde and A. And if it's strictly between A tilde and A, that means it's actually closer to A than A tilde. But, um, or sorry, it's closer to A hat than A tilde. But if it's closer to A hat than A tilde, then A tilde was not the projection. Okay, so this fact, it's not so hard to prove, but it's really important. So, you know, if you if you don't understand why it's true, take a minute to think about like why it's true. But we're going to like use that fact sort of in a minute. So let's let's now that we have these facts and these points defined, let's just calculate what is the distance between a tilde and a hat. So we want a tilde minus a hat. And it's going to be easiest to look at the square distance for now. Um, and so we'll, we'll look at the square distance for now. And the definition of the square distance is that it's like the inner product of this vector with itself. Okay, that's step one. 
It's that we just write the, dis the square distance as the inner product of the vector with itself. Now, here is like the the key the key fact, which is that if I look at um, if I look at a tilde minus a, so I'm looking now at like this vector, and I'm looking at its projection onto itself. And I'm saying that has to be shorter than the vector p minus a. Okay, and why is that true? Well, if you to look at it, right, p minus a is in the same direction but longer. So if I project a tilde minus a onto that longer vector, I can only make the inner product bigger. Right? So and the step, you know, it's like a little slick, but it's not too hard once you have the right picture. And um, now, because this is the orthogonal projection, this thing is exactly equal to the projection of the pink vector, to the inner product of the pink vector with a hat minus a. And that's just the definition of. Um, it's just like the definition of the orthogonal projection. And now this is, you know, I can write this as a tilde a hat minus a, or sorry, let me do one quick step. So this is a tilde minus a onto the vector z, so the noise vector that I added just by definition. And now this thing is exactly a tilde z minus a dot z. And by the triangle inequality, this is at most the absolute value of the inner product of a and z plus the absolute value of the inner product of a and z. All right, and so what I said is that the, the error this a tilde minus a in the two squared norm is at most the inner product of a tilde with z with the noise, so the inner product of a tilde with the noise, plus the absolute value of the inner product of a with the noise. So, all right, like what, I mean, so what? So the, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna note that each of these points, a tilde and a, are points in C. So I can write this as the being at most twice the largest inner product between any vector v that's in the feasible set C and the noise. All right. Okay, so I'm just using the fact that that you know all I know, all I'm actually using about a tilde and a is that they're both points in C. So I can replace these things with just whatever the largest inner product, um, whatever the you know the largest the inner product of v dot z can be with like any vector v that lives in C. Right. So again, you know, it's another statement. What is this good for? Now, you know, the first thing that's useful about this is that like this does not actually use anything about and this is like independent of a and a tilde. So like it's independent of anything about the actual answers. So we've expressed the uh, error, like we've expressed the error of this mechanism as some quantity that doesn't depend on the true answers themselves. Like it's now it like just depends on some property of the set C and the noise. All right. So it's still not really useful like what this is good for, or sorry, it's still not really obvious what this is good for, but like at least it's some quantity that doesn't depend on the true answers anymore. It's like some pro quantity that depends only on how much noise we're adding. So like the bigger Z is, like the larger this quantity will be. And the kind of shape of the set C, um, C, C. Okay, so 
it's like something we can analyze that gives us like a worst case bound over like different ants like different vectors a and a tilde like it doesn't have anything to do with the true answers anymore so that's like something good but again it's still not really obvious like what this thing should be so let's see like how to use this this analysis like let's see what we need to do so the error we want to bound is this thing on the left we want to bound the expectation over the noise because the noise is the thing that's random in the mechanism of the length of a tilde minus a divided by square root of k so this was our normalization that we used to just kind of make this solve make a little more sense and now using um, what's called Jensen's inequality, this is at most the square root of the expected value of that whole thing squared. Okay, so we're just using here a fact that like the expectation of z is at most the expectation of z squared to the one half. Hey, you can check that that's all I'm like applying. Sorry, I should not use z in here. Z is, I should use like some you know, other random variable. Also probably not a, I'm doing a really bad job of notation, w. Okay, so for any random variable w, the expectation of w is at most the square root of the expectation of w squared. Finally got that one right. Okay, so, um, Good. So now we know something about a tilde minus a. We know that a tilde minus a is at most the maximum of all vectors in C of the absolute value of v dot z. Okay, so we replace the inner thing with our bound, which is this, you know, blue quantity. So this is what we showed before. Okay, that was the thing we showed on the last slide. Whoops, I wrote that behind. Okay, so the thing we now want to analyze is the expected value over z of the max over v and c of inner product v and z. And remember, z is chosen from a normal random variable where the noise in each coordinate has variance sigma squared. Okay, so we want to analyze this thing. And remember, um, C is the convex hull of the points that are the columns of the matrix F. All right, so like Z is some vector. And we want to know like the largest like inner product of z with like any point. Uh, not sure what the point is, right? We want to know like the largest inner product over any point. And like a key fact is that the max over all points. In, in C, so an infinite number of points, is actually equal to the maximum over all of the vertices of the set C, which are just the columns. Okay, so we don't actually have to look at all of the points. We only have to actually look at the inner product of Z with the vertices of the set C. Okay, and that's a really important fact because we know something about the vertices of the set C, like they're all vectors that are columns of the query matrix. And there's not like an unreasonable number, you know, there's not an arbitrary number of them, there's only M of them. Okay, so this fact is saying that the maximizer of the inner product is a vertex of C. 
All right, you know, you can play around, you can sort of do a proof by picture to convince yourself that that's true. All right, so there's always one way of maximizing this inner product that's just choosing a vertex. It's not, you know, it could be that there's multiple solutions, but there's always at least one solution that's a vertex. Okay, so we need to analyze this thing now. Uh, yeah, so we need to analyze this thing. So we want to know, like, expectation over z of maximum over the vertices of the inner product of that vertex with z. And now we're kind of getting closer. So remember, since z is Gaussian, we know that the distribution of a vector cj take dot z is itself Gaussian, and its mean is zero still, and its variance is now the two squared norm of cj times sigma squared. Okay, so this random this inner product is a, itself a Gaussian in one dimension. It's just a, a one val a, a real valued Gaussian, and its variance now is proportional to the L two squared norm of C J. All right, and the other thing we know is that if um, Z one, yeah. And if like W1 through Wm are Gaussian with variance at most like sigma prime squared, then the expected max of W1 through Wm is at most sigma prime times the square root of log of m. So when we talked about the Gaussian mechanism, that was one of the first properties we noted that if you take a lot of Gaussian point, a lot of different Gaussians, and you, um, each one of them has standard deviations sigma prime, then if you take the maximum of m of them, the expectation of the maximum is only about a square root log m factor bigger than the expectation of each one of them, you know, the absolute value of each one. Put these in absolute value. All right, and so lastly, we know that cj2 squared is at most k if the queries are counts. Okay, so each of these is the column of some matrix where it's just a 0, 1 vector of length k, so the 2 squared norm is at most k. So putting all those things together, we get that this quantity, uh, sorry, this quantity is at most um, the, uh, is at most k to the 1 half times sigma times log to the 1 half of m, the number of vertices of c. All right, so we're getting like almost ready to, you know, plug something in. So let's go create a new page. So we had this whole like chain of things. And we just said that the expectation of the max of this is at most k to the 1 half times sigma times log to the 1 half of m 
And we also said that sigma for counts is at most constant depending on epsilon delta times root k over n. Okay, so putting this all together, we get that the expectation over z of the error is at most um, c epsilon delta times log to the one half times n all to the power one half. Okay, so wait a second. Where did all the k's go? So if you check that I didn't make any mistake, then what you get is that all the dependences on k cancel out. And what we're left with is just the following theorem. For any linear queries, f bounded there is a mechanism with error big O of constant times epsilon and delta. times log to the one half of the domain size m, n, divided by n, all to the power one half. And not only is there a mechanism, but the projection mechanism. All right, so we have a new analysis of the projection mechanism. I should also add one point, which is that, you know, actually this is like the minimum of this thing and c of epsilon and delta k to the one half over n because the projection mechanism can never increase the error so even if you know m is infinity and this new bound we proved is useless then you still get the same analysis as the gaussian mechanism okay so i should be a little more precise that this is only one way of analyzing the projection mechanism we can also just use the fact that it's in, it's um the gaussian mechanism plus an operation that can't increase the error but this new bound is pretty cool. So let's see why this new bound is so cool. Let's, let's do some comparison. So the original analysis of the Gaussian mechanism is some constant depending on the privacy parameters times k to the 1 half divided by n. And the new projection mechanism is this kind of different looking bound. So let's sort of compare the two things. So let's look at one con for the new analysis. So here, if you fix everything else and you look at how fast the error converges to zero as n gets bigger, you'll notice that the projection mechanism actually has like a worse analysis, right? So the denominator of the Gaussian mechanism is one over n, whereas the denominator of the projection mechanism is one over square root of n. So as n is getting bigger, the projection mechanism is not as good. Okay, so the regular Gaussian mechanism wins if n is really, really big. Okay, so like, you know, if you fix everything else and you just take n bigger and bigger, the Gaussian mechanism analysis will eventually be better than the projection mechanism analysis. Okay, again, it's not that the projection mechanism is worse because it, projection can't increase the error, it's just that the new analysis doesn't help. All right, but let's look at sort of an obvious pro. No dependence on k. So there's no explicit dependence on the number of queries. The number of queries I'm asking no longer matters. That's hugely important. Right? Remember, when we motivated this problem of linear query release, we talked about um, applications like the census where they wanted to release these enormous summary tables where each entry in the table is one linear query. And 
there are huge numbers of little demographic subsets I might care about, so the table itself is enormous. So the fact that the projection mechanism can give us error that's independent of the number of queries is, you know, hugely cool. All right, and then, you know, one thing that's kind of, I don't really want to call it a con because it's sort of a thing we traded for this awesome pro, so I, I don't want to make it feel bad, is that kind of in exchange, we get a dependence on the domain size. Remember, so this was the parameter m, which is the size of the domain. All right, and this dependence doesn't appear in the regular analysis of the Gaussian mechanism. Okay, so like this, this is not something that appears at all in the Gaussian mechanism. We don't care how big the domain is because it has no effect on the sensitivity. But in the projection mechanism, we actually do care a little bit about the domain. And your first reaction might be that, you know, it's okay, we only care about square root of log of the domain size. That should be basically nothing, right? But, you know, that's not exactly true, right? So, you know, consider like an example where um, the domain is like all strings of d bits. So the domain is, you know, I ask d yes or no questions. And maybe like the number of queries is like two to the d, or sorry, let's let's just say you know the, this is the domain. So for Gaussian, I get uh, proportional to k to the one half over n, and for projection, I get proportional to um, d to the one half over n, all to the power one half. Okay, so I'm replacing a dependence on k with this thing that now looks a little bit larger. It's like the dimension of the data. So it's like a polynomial dependence on how many kind of yes or no questions I asked in the data. On the other hand, if I want to ask a lot of questions, like if I set k to be something like 2 to the d, then the Gaussian mechanism gives me, uh, you know, 2 to the d over 2 over n, so exponential error in d versus something that's now just proportional to d to the one half over n all to the one half. So in order to get an answer that's interesting, meaning an answer whose error is smaller than one, I now only need n to be polynomial in the dimension of the data rather than potentially exponential in the data. Okay, so this is like really, really cool. We can answer exponential number of queries in the dimension of the data with polynomial sized data. Okay, so you can answer some huge, you know, huge family of queries with only a polynomial amount of data if you kind of measure it in terms of the dimension of the data. Okay, so this is like really fantastically cool. I don't know that I can like fully drive home without looking at, you know, even more examples, sort of just how cool I think this result is. Um, it just says that we can answer enormous sets of queries with sort of very little dependence on, or no dependence on the um, number of queries explicitly. I should, you know, caution that if the data domain is small, then there's kind of not too many queries. So there, there is some limit to how many queries you can, there really are to answer. But the point is that we can basically just throw more queries into the process without paying anything. So I think this is really cool. And we're actually going to spend the next couple lectures talking about different approaches to getting this type of guarantee in practice. So there are some issues with the projection mechanism, the most notable being that this is not a computationally efficient algorithm, um, and also some more technical points that we'll get into later. But we're going to spend the next several lectures kind of talking about this mechanism, this type of result, these me results that say I can answer huge sets of queries accurately with um, a small amount of data. So that's it for today, and I will see you in class. Thanks.